Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to the strain and counter strain approach for the upper quarter and the lower quarter. My name is Randall Kusanose. I'm a physical therapist from out in San Diego, California, and I will be your instructor for this presentation. Just a little bit about myself. I used to be the director of the Jones Institute for many years. I'm a longtime instructor of the strain and counter strain technique now over 32 years, and that's over 700 courses, both national and international. I'm also the lucky one that got to be mentored by the developer of the strain counter strain technique, Dr. Lawrence Jones. He was an osteopath from Ontario, Oregon, and we traveled together for nine years teaching counter strain. So he mentored me on so many things, not just counter strain, not just treating patients, but he influenced me a lot in my financial life. He taught me a lot about international travel. Uh, he was a very big influence on my life. So when I talk about the origin of counter strain, I will talk about Dr. Jones much more. How this course is going to run, I'm going to start out by giving you a definition for the strain counter strain technique. We're going to talk about the origin of counter strain, how it was developed. Uh, we'll talk about um, the diagnostic tool that we're going to use with the counter strain technique, how to apply this technique, what types of patients it's going to be good for, uh, how to use it in conjunction with other systems of treatment you commonly use. Uh, there'll be some general rules that we'll be finishing up with at the end of the introductory lecture. Now, to start out, uh, the definition for strain counter strain, it is an osteopathic, so its origin is in the osteopathic profession. It's an osteopathic manual medicine technique for the treatment of somatic dysfunction that involves a passive positional procedure that places the body in a position of greatest comfort, thereby relieving pain and dysfunction by reduction and arrest of inappropriate proprioceptor activity. So I realize that is a mouthful, so I'm going to break it down for you. It is a passive positional procedure, meaning you as a clinician are going to passively manipulate your patient's body to a position that you want it in. You basically do all the work, your patient just relaxes. It places the body in a position of greatest comfort. Counter strain will take painful, restricted muscles and or joints and for treatment it's going to position it away from pain, away from the restricted barrier, away from the direction in which joint motion will bind, and move it toward a direction of ease and comfort. Counter strain is therefore considered an indirect technique because its action for treatment moves away from the restricted barrier. This is as opposed to direct techniques, which most of you are probably more used to, where you're engaging the restricted barrier and trying to push through it. Most of your mobilization techniques where you're mobilizing a joint, this is a direct technique because you're engaging the restricted barrier. Muscle energy, muscle energy technique that some of you may use also is a direct technique because we engage the restricted barrier. Counter strain, we're going to move away from it, so it's considered an indirect technique. So it relieves pain and dysfunction by reduction and arrest of inappropriate proprioceptor activity. What counter strain thinking is directed toward is not so much tissue injury or tissue damage, it's not so much your sprains or your strains, but rather it's aberrant neuromuscular reflexes within that tissue. Specifically, our rationale is going to single out the muscle spindle as pumping out aberrant afferent information to the central nervous system, maintaining a unilateral spasm around a joint which fixates that joint in a certain direction, not allowing that joint to regain neutral, creating and maintaining a neuromuscular joint dysfunction. Uh, we also have another um, definition, it's more current definition, and I'm going to just read that to you, that the Jones counter strain is an advanced manual therapy procedure that removes painful and reflexive contractions from the body via gentle and passive body positioning that slackens or decompresses the targeted tissue. So counter strain is in a group of treatments called positional release techniques. So we're gonna use body positioning to treat the dysfunction. 
Now that I've given you the definition for strain and counterstrain, I want to talk about the origin of counterstrain. So I've already told you that counterstrain was developed by an osteopath named Dr. Lawrence Jones, who practiced in a little town of Ontario, Oregon, which is right on the Oregon-Idaho border, and he practiced there his entire career. But back in 1955, Dr. Jones, uh, being an osteopath, did osteopathic high-velocity manipulation. That was his mode of treatment. And he had a patient come into his office with what he called psoasitis. Now, psoasitis to him was someone that came in stooped over like this, could not come up to a fully erect posture, and had constant pain across his low uh, lumbar and sacral iliac area. Couldn't straighten up at all. Okay? Now, this patient had been seen previously by two chiropractic physicians, both of which saw him for six weeks each applying chiropractic high-velocity manipulation. Now, Dr. Jones, being an osteopath, believes that his osteopathic manipulation is far superior to chiropractic manipulation, so he did his own osteopathic high-velocity techniques for this guy for, again, a period of six weeks, and again, with absolutely no relief of symptoms. Okay? Dr. Jones said, I was doing everything I could think to do for this guy, and nothing seemed to work for him. So one day, the guy comes in the office and says, you know, Doc, I've had this problem a long time now, and it's gotten to the point where I can't sleep at night. I can maybe stay in one position for about 10 minutes, and it starts to hurt, and I'm constantly tossing and turning all night. He said, you know, maybe if I could just get a good night's sleep, maybe I'd feel better. Well, that made some sense to Dr. Jones, and given he wasn't doing him any good with his treatments anyway, he decided to spend his treatment session seeing, he, seeing if he could find a position that was comfortable for this patient. So he has him down in a supine position. He's flexing, he's extending, he's side bending, he's rotating, he's doing all of these things to his body. And after about 20 minutes, he finds this position where the patient is supine, the knees are flexed way up toward his chest, rotated way off to one side, and there's a certain amount of side bending. And he gets him in this position, and the patient says, you know, Doc, I think this feels pretty good. I don't think I hurt right now. Well, Dr. Jones is thinking, you know, that's the only good I've done for this guy, or anyone has done for this guy, for about four months. So you know I didn't have the heart to take him out of this position. So I just left him there. I pillowed him, and I left him there, and I went and treated another patient. So 20 minutes later, he came back, and the patient was still comfortable. So Dr. Jones says, well, maybe this will work. Why don't you try to get in? I know it's a weird position, but try to get into this position tonight and let's see if you sleep better. Well, the patient agrees, and Dr. Jones has the guy slowly sit up. Then he has him slowly stand up, and the guy stands up. He's completely erect, and he's pain-free. He's excited. He's going crazy. Doc, my back doesn't hurt. Dr. Jones said he was happy, but more than anything else, he was dumbfounded that just putting him in a comfortable position could give them this kind of results. He said that it was his level of frustration, the fact that he tried everything he could think to do for this guy and nothing worked, that when this happened, it made him start to think, maybe there's something better out there than what I'm currently doing. So he started to take the idea of position of release and he applied it to all joint dysfunctions, okay? Now in the beginning, he said his results were a little bit sketchy, but he started to learn certain things about applying this technique. And what he found was once you were in the position and he had them held there, uh, the return to neutral had to be done very slowly. If it wasn't done very slowly, it would kind of reinitiate the dysfunction and the technique wasn't effective. So he learned, especially in the first 15 to 20 degrees of the return to neutral, to do that very, very slowly. He also found that since the initial guy took 20 minutes um, to get the result, 
when he first started applying the technique, he would hold people in these positions for 20 minutes. But that became very restricting to his practice. So he started to whittle it down minute by minute by minute until he got down to 90 seconds. He found that less than 90 seconds, his results weren't as good, but greater than 90 seconds didn't seem to increase the benefit to the patient. So that's how he settled in on 90 seconds. Now in this class, we're gonna talk about uh, holding the position for 45 to 90 seconds because we've added certain facilitators that will make the process of shutting off the aberrant reflex mechanism faster. So we'll talk about that when we do demonstration. But that was his first um, initial experience that got him starting to experiment with position of release. And over the next 10 years, he was able to develop techniques for all the different parts of the body. Dr. Jones's second observation that hastened the development of the strain counter strain technique was another patient that he was treating for psoasitis. And the patient was doing well enough with his treatment that he could go out to his garden and work his garden because it was full of weeds and whatnot. So he's out there with a hoe pulling or getting weeds out of his garden. And while doing that, the end of the hoe kind of hits a rock and he tries to get it out of the soil. So he yanks on it, which jams the handle of the hoe deep into his groin area, which would cause anybody a certain amount of pain, but it caused this guy such severe pain it just dropped him down to the ground, okay? Eventually he was able to get back up, but fearing a rupture, he called Dr. Jones and said, Dr. Jones, I think I just ruptured myself. So Dr. Jones said, well, come on in and I'll check you out. So he came in and Dr. Jones evaluated him and he found no signs of a hernia. But he found this point on the inferior medial aspect of the anterior inferior iliac spine that when he touched it even lightly would skyrocket the patient right off the table. Now, he assured the patient he didn't have a hernia. He had this point. He wasn't sure why he had the point, but he didn't think it was too serious. Now, the patient's next scheduled appointment was the next day for his psoasitis, and given he was in the clinic Right now, Dr. Jones just decided to treat him for his psoasitis and he wouldn't have to come back the next day. So while he has him in the treatment position for the psoasitis and having nothing else better to do for his 90 seconds, he reaches down and he pokes that little point on the inferior aspect of the anterior inferior iliac spine and the patient doesn't respond. So he pokes it a little bit harder. Patient doesn't respond. So he smashes on it. Patient says, hey, I don't know, doc, it doesn't hurt now. So boom, it's like this light bulb goes on in his head and he's thinking, is that what it is? Is there tender points that correlate with each of these dysfunctions? And I can start to use these tender points to make my diagnoses and also be able to tell if my treatments are effective. So from that, he starts scouring every square inch of the anterior and posterior aspect of the body, and he finds tender points. And he starts to correlate them with very specific joint dysfunctions. And this is one of the uh, greatest finds that Dr. Jones made, was correlating these specific tender points with somatic dysfunction. There are many techniques in the osteopathic profession that are positional release techniques. So you're using body position to treat the dysfunction, but none of them have these tender points to make the diagnosis. So you are a little bit uh, dependent on your palpation skills to be able to really feel where the position is right, where everything is releasing. But in counter strain, we have this tool called the tender point, and we'll always know if the treatment position is correct and whether it's effectively treating that dysfunction, because if it is, the tender point is gone. So you'll always know if the technique is working, and not only will you know, but the patient always knows if the treatment is working. So that's really nice for the patient too, because they can feel the change, they can feel the release of uh, dysfunction and the reduction in pain. 
Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, origin of the Jones Institute. Um, first thing, I met Dr. Jones back in 1985. So I took a class from him uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, at the time, he was only teaching but one class a year on the counterstring technique. Uh, and so I was lucky enough to find out about this course, and I was interested, so I, I took it. To be honest, it wasn't a great course. I hardly learned anything. There was really no syllabus for the course, and uh, Dr. Jones's biggest uh, emphasis was to show people that it worked. He really wanted to show people that this technique works really, really well, and so not so he would show all the techniques but primarily what he would do is patient demonstrations. He would bring in patients and he would just treat them as the students watched. Now he didn't have it organized that if he showed you the cervical tender points and techniques that he had a cervical patient come in. It could have been an ankle patient or a knee patient. So to be honest, he didn't really know what he was doing. And so uh, it was really difficult to get a lot from that class. So after that first class, out of 180 techniques that he showed us, I only remembered three. Well, that was it, just three. And I got back uh, to the clinic, and I said, well, I remember these three, so I'm going to try them. And I tried them, and they worked really, really well. So it made me think, hey, there's got to be something here with this technique. And so a year later, I went back, because again, he was only teaching but one class a year. Uh, I went back and told him that I got such great results with these one, three techniques that I really want to learn more. So I think he was a little surprised. He wasn't used to his students um, being so interested in his technique because he was primarily teaching osteopaths. And this was a time in the osteopathic profession where their development was moving way more toward osteo, excuse me, way more toward allopathic medicine. They were practicing more like medical doctors than they were osteopaths. So they were starting to shy away from their manual techniques because now they were working in uh, allopathic hospitals and it hinted a little of chiropractic and so therefore they didn't feel like they got the right respect from the medical doctors. So they were starting to shy away from their manual roots and this is when Dr. Jones was trying to give it to them. So they thought it was nice, um, but they really weren't interested in doing it. So I went out to lunch with Dr. Jones at that time and he expressed to me that the biggest fear in his life is that he would die and counterstrain would die with him because there wasn't anybody to carry it on. So this is where I started thinking, you know, maybe I know an audience that might like this technique. So I introduced him to physical therapist. Um, so we did, uh, I set up a couple of classes, one in San Diego, one in San Francisco, and um, I was still kind of in the process of, of learning the technique, but he took me under his wing and really showed me how to do stuff and really how to do each technique. And so after a while, I was able to write a syllabus for it, uh, and that made it a lot more learnable for the students. And so uh, we started out with two, the next year we did six, the next year we did 12, and the next year we kept doubling, you know. Uh, our courses. So we started the Jones Institute back in 1988 as a vehicle through which we could disseminate the strain counter strain method. So at the time of his passing, he would feel confident that counter strain would far outlive him. Okay. Well, he passed away in 1996, and by 1996, we'd been all over the country doing multiple, multiple courses, and so he was very confident that Counterstrain was going to outlive him. 
And he got such a kick out of uh, teaching physical therapists because they would write him letters thanking him for developing the technique. They liked to lab, and he would see them labbing before class. He'd see them labbing after class. And they were so excited about learning the technique that he just loved physical therapists as an audience. So uh, he would be more than happy to see how counter-strain has grown uh, all over the world. Because now through the Jones Institute, we have satellites in Europe, we have satellites in Australia. Uh, we've taught in seven countries in Europe, three, con uh, three countries in Asia and Australia. So the growth of counter-strain just continues to take off. People realize, wow, this is a really cool technique. It's very gentle, easy on patients, and really easy on operators. You don't have to expend a lot of energy to get these really great results. So the growth of counter-strain has been really, really tremendous over these last uh, 20 years. By this time, we had taken Dr. Jones' 185 original counterstrain techniques and expanded that to about 255 techniques covering uh, different areas of the body, more in the cranium and uh, more techniques for the shoulder. And as counterstrain was growing, we uh, trained more instructors uh, to help us teach. One of those instructors was a physical therapist from out on the East Coast named Brian Tucky, uh, who became a certified counter-strain instructor back in the late 1990s. Uh, now, Brian, a very intelligent guy who was applying counter-strain quite successfully in his practice, uh, but he had taken a Baral course and learned about manipulating the uh, viscera and the effect that it had on the body. And <clears throat> he started to take the idea of treating viscera and he applied a counterstrain approach for it. And so his first one, I forget what organ it was that he treated, but he was able to treat, I think, a liver or something. Uh, and the patient got great results using the uh, position uh, of ease or direction of ease and trying to find uh, a position that would soften everything around that visceral structure. And from that experience and the good results that he got, he started applying that concept to all the viscera. So he came up with a uh, counterstrain class, which was counterstrain for the viscera, so treating um, so many of the organs and the fascia of the uh, viscera. From that experience, uh, he just went crazy, started applying the concept of uh, counterstrain to all the different systems of the body, from the neurologic system to the venous and lymphatic system, the arterial system, um, the ligamentous system, the cartilage system. So uh, with all the techniques that he has developed for counterstrain for all the different systems of the body, we probably have over a thousand techniques now in the counterstrain system. Because of Brian's work, counterstrain continues to evolve and more techniques are continually developed. This is going to help counterstrain's growth throughout the United States and the world. I've talked about tender points, but I haven't defined them for you. We actually have two definitions for tender points. One is what a tender point is going to feel like, and the other is what we believe they are. And what they feel like are tense, tender, edematous muscle and fascial tissue, approximately a half a centimeter in diameter. Now that, as a general description for what dysfunctional tissue or tender point tissue is going to feel like is uh, okay. Uh, but what dysfunctional tissue will feel like can differ depending on the area in which you're palpating. In some areas, the dysfunctional tissue indicating a tender point will be very tight and hard. In some areas, it can feel thick and kind of dense. In some areas, it'll feel boggy and edematous. In some areas, there'll be little cupules, little holes, little depressions in the tissue that tells you there is a tender point. 
in some areas when you slide your fingers on the skin, your fingers will stick on the skin like someone sprayed hairspray on it and it sticks and holds. And that's what we call drag. And when you feel drag, there's a tender point underneath it. Now, I can go on and on with adjectives that describe dysfunctional tissue, therefore tender point tissue. But what you need to primarily know is that tender point tissue does not feel normal. It does not feel soft, bouncy, resilient, and smooth. So if you feel something other than that, if you push on it, it'll probably hurt and it'll probably be a tender point. We also define these tender points as a sensory manifestation of a neuromuscular or musculoskeletal dysfunction. So what they are are small zones of referred pain which are very, very specific to a muscle and or joint dysfunction. And we're gonna use these tender points to not only make our diagnosis, but also to monitor the effectiveness of our treatment techniques. Because if you're effective with your counterstrain technique, then this tender point is completely gone. Okay, so you will always know if the technique works. Now, the term tender point does not accurately describe the exquisite pain that your patients can perceive when the point is palpated. Dr. Jones originally called them trigger points, but since Janet Travell kind of beat him to popularizing that term, he switched to tender points just to avoid the confusion. Now, for it to be a true counterstrain tender point, it needs to be a minimum of four times more tender than normal tissue. Some of them are 10 and 15 times more tender than normal tissue. So if you are pushing with enough force to blanch your fingernail bed, or pushing with enough force maybe to elicit a mild response from normal tissue, the response if you're on a tender point is the patient's gonna jump or they're gonna grimace. That's what we call the jump sign or the grimace sign indicating the patient perceived a very sharp-like pain when that point is palpated, okay? This is a true counterstrain point, and this is where you're gonna get your best results. It is very common for tender points to be found in the belly of a muscle involved with that dysfunction, but they can also be found at the musculotendinous junction. They can be found at the tendinous osseous junction, and they can also be found completely away from the area of dysfunction because these are referred points. For example, this tender point that I'm going to find right here on the mandible behind the lobe of the ear. If I feel density and thickness of tissue back here, I will push in an anterior direction. And if the patient jumps, that is what we call an anterior C1 dysfunction or anterior first cervical dysfunction, indicating an atlas on axis rotatory dysfunction. So to treat that, we are going to do a uh, atlas on axis rotation away from the side of the tender point. And we go away from the side of the tender point, we're gonna feel the relaxation here at the tender point site, okay? It's going to soften, it's going to relax, so then now when I push on it, it no longer hurts, okay? So all I'm doing is I'm treating the atlas on axis, treating the uh, muscles that will rotate the atlas on the axis anteriorly, the rectus capitis anterior minor, and posteriorly the inferior oblique muscle. But the effect is that it treats a painful point here behind the mandible. So this is a case where a tender point lies completely away from the area of dysfunction. In your syllabus, you have this illustration which shows the magnitude of the number of points we have mapped out all over the body. So you can see that they are going to be specific for specific muscles, like we see this one here right uh, on the dorsal surface of the scapula in the infraspinous fossa. So right in the belly, the infraspinatus muscle. So it's quite specific for that muscle dysfunction. So we will have points for basically all the muscles of the body. You'll also see that they're gonna lie all over the spinous processes uh, and transverse processes. This 
this is where each tender point is going to indicate a very specific dysfunction in the axial skeleton. And just from finding that tender point, you'll be able to determine how that joint is going to be restricted three-dimensionally. Now, if, again, if we look at this picture, we see we have tender points all over the posterior aspect of the body as well as the anterior aspect of the body. So posteriorly, we have them on the occiput. We have them in the posterior cervical spine, posterior thoracic spine, posterior lumbar spine, posterior pelvis, sacrum, coccyx, down the lower extremity all the way down to the calcaneus. Uh, and as well as the scapula and then down the uh, posterior aspect of the upper extremity. Okay. Now, posterior tender points are very much correlated with an area of pain complaint. So if someone has a pain complaint of lumbar pain here, go hunt this area for our tender points. You'll find tender points there that will correlate with the pain complaint that the patient has. So posterior tender points, posterior pain tend to go together. Now, posterior uh, tender points that causes posterior pain is described in a very characteristic way. It's described as sharp, stabbing, very localized pain. Patients know exactly where the pain is coming from and will take a singular digit and point right to it. It's like, oh, it kills me in my sacral iliac joint right here. I get this headache that starts right here and comes up over the top of my head. Patients are going to describe their uh, pain symptoms that way. Very specific. Okay, so again, Posterior tender points, posterior pain, especially described in a, uh, as a sharp, stabbing, and localized pain. Anterior tender points, you can see we have a multitude of anterior points. Anterior tender points, meaning anterior dysfunction, is also correlated with a posterior pain complaint. There oftentimes is not a lot of awareness of these anterior points to the patient until someone like yourself who knows what they're doing goes and probes them. Patients don't know that they hurt in the front. Their pain is in the back. Now, we think this is one of Dr. Jones' greatest contributions to the treatment of musculoskeletal dysfunction is that he has mapped out the anterior representation of dysfunction, which produces your patient's posterior pain complaint. Now, posterior uh, pain caused by anterior dysfunction is also described in a very characteristic way. It's described as deep, achy, and diffuse pain. Patients have a difficult time localizing exactly where the pain is coming from and will take generally their whole hand and go, ah, it just aches across my back and down into my buttocks. It aches across my shoulders and into my neck. It just feels so stiff and so tight, okay? Very common pain complaints, and when you hear deep, achy, diffuse pain complaints, you should start thinking anterior dysfunction. There are many pearls that you're gonna get from this class, but for a lot of you, this is the number one pearl to learn from this presentation, and that is to be able to evaluate and treat anterior dysfunction as the cause of your patient's posterior pain complaint. So if you've never evaluated, therefore never treated it, it is a major reason why your patients don't get all the way better or don't get any better because you're treating the wrong side. I treat a lot of chronic pain patients and um, patients that have had chronic pain for two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And I am convinced that a lot of chronic pain is caused by no clinician addressing the correct area of dysfunction. And for most of those patients, it's going to be anterior, okay? You start checking them anterior, you will find that this whole anterior area of the pelvis and the abdominal area is a veritable treasure chest of dysfunction. You start clearing that out 
and posterior pain, if it's caused by this anterior dysfunction, will dissipate. I fully expect, even with chronic pain patients, and I don't care how long they've had it, five years, 10 years, 20 years, that within two visits, I can make a substantial change with them. That I can get them 50, 60, 70% improved just by treating the correct area of their dysfunction. Now that we've found a tender point, now we've made a diagnosis. Now that we've made a diagnosis, now we want to treat it. Now the way we're going to treat with counter strain is we're going to find the position of comfort or the position of release. Okay? Now there are two ways in which we can find that position of comfort or release. The first way, the easiest way, the way that most everybody starts out using counter strain is using your patient's verbal feedback to help you to know if this tender point is now gone. So how this works, let's just say you found a point right here, and this is on the second rib in the midclavicular line. It's what we call a depressed second rib point. Okay? Now, to treat this depressed second rib, the technique is cervical flexion, side bending, rotation toward, kind of taking the chin and pointing it toward the tender point. Okay. So let's say you're a new graduate and you don't have a lot of palpation skills yet. Okay. So you're going to uh, have them in this position. And again, having no real palpation skills yet, you're going to push on that point now and say to the patient, is that better, same, or worse? And the patient goes, oh, ow, that still really hurts. Well, that tells you, I guess I did not move him in the right position yet. So you start to tune it, you start to change it. So as you do that, let's see, I'm gonna take out a little bit of flexion and I'm gonna take out a little bit of rotation. And let's see, I'm gonna start here, I can't really feel any difference, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna push on it again and say to the patient, is that better, same or worse? And if the patient goes, it still hurts, but maybe not as bad as last time. Now, that doesn't sound great, but at least you did something that was a little bit better. So then you can start thinking, let's see, what did I do? Well, I took out a little flexion, I took out a little rotation. So I'm gonna take out a little more flexion and a little more rotation, and then I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna push on it now and say to the patient, how's that? Better, same, or worse? And if the patient goes, hey, that's gone. Hey, how did you do that? That's amazing, okay? That's a wonderful answer, and that's what you're gonna stop, and you're gonna hold that for the necessary amount of time, either 45 to 90 seconds. So that's using your uh, patient's verbal feedback to kind of guide you to where the uh, release point is going to be. It's not really what I want you to depend on, okay? Because sometimes patients aren't as consistent as we would like it to be. So it's a little bit like that game you played with your parents when you were a little kid where they would hide something in the house and you'd have to go hunt for it. And if you were in the wrong, headed in the wrong direction, they'd say, ah, cold, ooh, freezing, frozen, you know, not good. And you'd turn around and go the other way, ah, getting warmer, 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 hot, 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 hot. You know, kind of like that. So it's kind of what you're doing here. Um, it does help, uh, but it's not really what I want you to do, depend on. I would much rather you depend on your palpation skills. Now, one thing about counter strain is the better palpation skills you have, the better you're going to be at this technique. So if you have great palpation skills, boom, you will just fly with this technique. But if you feel a little more palpatorily challenged or just don't have a lot of experience palpating tissue, this is a wonderful technique in which you can develop very competent hands. Because it forces you to concentrate on what you're palpating throughout each technique. And if you do that, if you really concentrate on what you're palpating, it doesn't take that long to start to develop educated hands. And I can tell you from my experience as a physical therapist now for 42 years, the development of my hands and my ability to feel has uh, taken me to levels in which I would have never guessed um, I could have achieved with manual therapy. You know, most people in our profession were all very smart. You know, you have to be pretty smart to get into our programs and graduate from the programs. 
So the problem is not uh, intellectual. The problem is most of you never develop your hands. And I can tell you from experience, if you develop your hands and put those together with what you know up here, you become a very powerful and viable tool toward healing. Okay, I cannot say that enough. I'm a palpation guy. So if you take a class from me, I stress palpation, palpation, palpation. Being able to feel the structures that you're looking for, feeling for dysfunction, feeling when it releases. Okay. Uh, with counter strain, that is the key. The key to your success in counter strain is being able to feel that mobile point, the point where everything releases and mushes. If you can feel that, you can do counter strain anywhere in the body. But you can have a photographic memory and memorize all 180 techniques that I'm going to present in this class. But if you can't feel mobile points, you will not be any good with this technique. Okay, so in the live class, that is the emphasis. We really stress developing your palpation skills, being able to feel those mobile points. Because again, it is the key to your success. The second way in which we're gonna find the position of comfort or the release position is being able to feel for what we call in counter strain as the mobile point. Okay. The mobile point is not really a point, it's more of a feeling. So it is defined as the feeling of maximum relaxation of the tissue beneath your monitoring finger where movement in any direction will increase tissue tension. So it is that one position where the tissue beneath your monitoring finger just turns mushy, okay? just turn soft, and when you push on it, it is painless. But if you were to move it just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it would increase tissue tension, okay? That is called the mobile point. And not to be so redundant, but that is, again, the key to your success is your ability to find and feel that. Now, the way to find the mobile point is to follow the directions in the book in terms of how much flexion, side bending, rotation you want to put them in. This is going to get you close to the um, position in which this, this dysfunction will shut off. Okay? You can help yourself a little by adding a slight compressive force through the tender point. And when we do the live uh, demonstrations, I will show you how to compress through the tender point. Because when you do that, it approximates the tissue around the tender point itself. And the first thing you'll notice is what's called a therapeutic pulse. Okay, This pulse is a little bit slower than the cardiac pulse, but you'll feel a very definite pulse underneath your finger. Now, this pulse uh, with recent studies has shown that it is the drainage of interstitial fluid from the interstitium, and it's draining out inflammatory metabolites, which is why the tender point starts to diminish in tenderness as it drains out. Now, this therapeutic pulse doesn't tell you you're exactly on the mobile point, but it tells you you are very, very close. So once you start to feel that little pulse, and if you do that little compression trick, which I'll show you in demonstration, you should be able to find and feel it. Then you're just gonna tune ever so small to knock out that last little bit so that when you push on it, it will be completely painless. So when you're using your palpation skills to find and feel that mobile point, it's really wonderful if you can teach your patients to give you feedback that's helpful. Okay, so if you push on it and the patient says, still hurts, I can still feel the pain, that's not good feedback. Um, because some of your patients tend to be a little bit negative, and if it's not 100% gone, it's not gone at all. Okay, on that flip side, some of, you, some of your patients are pleasers, and they want to please you. And you're going to push on it, and you're going to say, how does that feel? And they're going to go, oh, that's a lot better. Okay. But if you were to ask them, percentage-wise, how much better is it? Well, honey, it's at least 20% better, which isn't really that much better. 
So uh, it's important to teach your patients to give you feedback that is helpful, okay? So uh, what's nice to do is teach your patients to give you percentages of better. So when you push on it, compared to what it was before, if I push on it now, how much better do you think it is? If they say 30% better, then you still have some moving to do with your treatment position. But if they say it's 50% better, 50% doesn't mean you're halfway there. 50% usually means you're within two hairs width of completely gone. It means you're very, very close. Okay, so therefore you know when you're tuning, you're gonna tune really, really, really small to get that last 50% in. If they say it's 70% better, then you're within one hair's width of gone. Some little nothing, little twitch will knock it completely out, okay? If it's 80% or better, usually if you just leave it in that position, give it like 15 to 30 seconds, it'll just be gone without a amount of time, okay? So keep that in mind. If you teach your patients to give you feedback that's helpful, it, is, it does make it easier to find that mobile point. Again, still hurts and that's a lot better, things like that. That is not good feedback that helps you. Now, in your syllabus, you have this little graph, okay? So I wanna talk about this graph because it talks about a very common mistake that new counter strainers will make. So in this graph, what we are graphing here uh, on the horizontal line is the range of motion of a joint in a singular plane. And I'm gonna call this plane the sagittal plane. So the center line here is neutral within the sagittal plane. So motion in this direction, I'm gonna call flexion. Motion in this direction is extension, okay? This line here is the tender point response to motion in that plane. So this axis here is going to graph the level of pain. So, and this little X here is the position of the joint in which the tender point was found, all right? Now, here, if I start to move the joint into extension, my palpating finger will perceive increasing tissue tension, okay? The patient would notice increasing pain, so that tells me, uh-oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. So I reverse now and go from extension now into flexion. Now, as I go into flexion, my palpating finger will start to perceive decreasing tissue tension and the patient will perceive decreasing pain, okay? Until I go all the way down till the tissue tension drops off into what we would call the mobile point. But you can see here, if you continue to go into flexion even further, then tissue tension and pain starts to increase. So you can go beyond the mobile point, which is the most common mistake that neophytes with counter strain will make. With their initial position, they are already over here. They're beyond the mobile point. And your first inclination is always to move into greater and greater amounts of motion when you start to fine tune, okay? My advice to all of you is when you start to fine tune that position to find that mobile point, always fine tune first into lesser amounts of motion, lesser amounts of flexion, rotation, side bending, and more times than not, if you do that, you will fall into your mobile point, okay? Right in there. So, I wanted to just mention that to you because it's a very common mistake. So I want to review very quickly all the steps that you take when doing a counter strain treatment. The first thing is you want to locate the tender point because that's how you make your diagnosis. So once we locate the tender point, we're gonna take all of our pressure off and monitor with a very light touch. 
This is also a common mistake that uh, physical therapists will tend to make because for whatever reason, once we get our finger on the tissue, on the tender point, we kind of want to keep boring into it. It's just part of what we do as a physical therapist, okay? But that's counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish, okay? These points, one, they're exquisitely painful, so if you keep pressure on it, it just stimulates the nociceptors to keep firing, and if they're firing, you're gonna have a hard time shutting down this aberrant reflex mechanism. Also, because many of these points do lie in the belly of the muscle involved, if you're keeping pressure in the belly of the muscle involved, that's actually a form of a stretch to that muscle because it's gonna spread the fibers out. We're not looking to stretch it. We wanna shorten it, we wanna relax it, we wanna compress it, okay? So make sure you have no pressure on the point, just the very light touch because in counter strain, we are not treating the tender point. The tender point is just a sensory manifestation of the dysfunction, and we're gonna treat the dysfunction by body positioning. We're gonna position that body so that structure, be it a joint or a muscle, is being approximated. And if we do that well, then this point of tenderness goes away. This is why counter strain is different from other forms of, or techniques that use points for diagnosis. Um, in all the other forms, be it trigger points, acupuncture, acupressure, ginseng, Chapman's reflex points, the list really goes on and on of different uh, forms of treatment that will use points, okay? In all of those forms of treatment, the point is the dysfunction, whether it indicates the blockage of the flow of qi through a particular meridian, or it indicates a visceral somatic dysfunction, uh, or visceral neurolymphatic, excuse me, or a neurolymphatic dysfunction. The point is the problem, and so you are going to stick a needle in it, you're gonna smash on it, you're gonna thumb it, you're gonna ultrasound it, you're gonna electrocute it, you're gonna spray vapor coolants on it and stretch it. You're gonna do something to the point. But in counter strain, we do nothing to the point. We only find it to make the diagnosis and we monitor it lightly to see if the technique is effective. Because if the technique is effective, the tender point goes away. So as we monitor the point lightly, we are then going to put the patient in the treatment position because that's how we're going to treat it. Now, as we put it in that treatment position, you want to be able to apply a mild compression through the tender point. Putting that mild compression through the tender point is going to approximate the tissue around that tender point, and that's what'll get it to pulse, where you start to get that therapeutic pulse, and you start to get the drainage of those inflammatory metabolites, which starts to take the pain out of the tender point itself. Once you add that compression through the tender point as you're tuning, you usually get a nice feeling of that therapeutic pulse, which tells you you're very, very close to the mobile point. Here, you're just gonna tune in very small uh, motions, like one or two hairs width really is all it takes, okay? Once you do that, you'll feel where the, the tender point completely drops off, where the tissue beneath the tender point completely drops off, turns to mush. You're now in your mobile point. From here, we're gonna hold it for between 45 and 90 seconds or until that therapeutic pulse stops. Once that stops, which usually is about 30 to 40, 50 seconds, then the treatment can be over. You're gonna slowly return it back to neutral. Recheck the tender point. Needs to be a minimum of 70% relieved to be considered an effective counterstrain treatment. Okay, so you don't have to be perfect with counterstrain, but it needs to be at least 70% improved. Once the therapeutic pulse has stopped and you've now checked the tender point and it is completely gone, then you wanna to return to neutral in a very slow manner, especially in the first 15 to 20 degrees of that return to motion. These proprioceptive 
proprioceptors are sensitive to rate of change. And so if you move too fast, it could stimulate that proprioceptor to start firing, firing again, getting that tender point to come back. So again, especially in the first 15 to 20 degrees, we're going to move very slowly back toward neutral. Once you get past that 15 to 20 degrees, then you can go down at a more normal pace. Here are the general rules for applying counterstrain as a treatment modality. The first two are a little redundant, but they're probably the most important, that we're going to hold the position for between 45 and 90 seconds. Once the treatment is done, we're going to return to neutral slowly, especially in the first 15 to 20 degrees of that return toward neutral. The next rules are anterior points are usually treated in flexion, and posterior points are usually treated in extension. We do, of course, have some exception to that rule, but usually it holds. Because quite commonly, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be folding the body over the tender point. So if the tender point is here, I'm going to fold the body over it. If the point is here, I'm going to fold the body over it. If the point is here, I'm going to fold the body over it. If the point is here, I'm going to fold it over this way. So quite commonly, that rule holds true. Tender points on or near the midline are treated usually in the sagittal plane or flexion or extension. Because if the point is midline, pretty much straight sagittal motion is going to bend over the top of it or fold over the top of it. But if the tender point is more lateral to midline, out in here, the points still require, if it's anterior, still some flexion, but there's more side bending and more rotation that you're going to do when the point is more lateral to midline out here and here to fold over the top of it. So if the point is here, straight flexion. But if the point is here, flexion with deviation over the top. Okay. Uh, with multiple tender points, this gets us into sequencing, and sequencing is very important in counterstrain, okay? Because when you do, uh, well, on the uh, last day of the um, live uh, course, I will show you how to do a full body scan to find where all the areas of dysfunction are, so you'll be able to sequence the treatment of those dysfunctions in the right order. Okay, so uh, we are going to sequence our, the treatment of our dysfunctions working proximal to distal, okay, and by picking the hottest point in an area first. Uh, we also will do middles of rows. A lot of spinal uh, dysfunction will have three, four, five levels right in a row, or that's also true for long muscles like a sartorius or a gracilis or an IT band where you'll have three, four, five points in a row. If that's the case, try treating the one in the middle. All of them will be treated somewhat similarly. So if we treat the one in the middle, we can get results above it and below it and knock out three, four, five points with one position. Okay. So those are just some of our general rules for sequencing. Now, why sequencing is important is um, if you sequence incorrectly and you treat a distal dysfunction when there's a proximal one that's feeding it, then that distal dysfunction just keeps coming back. The next time the patient comes in, it's going to be back again because it's going to be fed by the proximal dysfunction. If you treat a point that is maybe less hot than points, other points in that area, then that lesser point is just going to come back, okay? So points that keep coming back, you should not have to treat any one point more than three different times before you should expect it to stay gone if you're sequencing properly. If you have to do it more than three times, then generally it's a sequencing problem and you have a more proximal dysfunction or a hotter dysfunction in the area that you need to find and treat. So proper sequencing, besides getting your treatments to hold, will also reduce your workload. Because if you start proximal, let's say you scanned a patient and let's say you found 50 points, which isn't uncommon on a chronic pain patient. 
okay? If I sequence correctly and get the top one-third of those 50 and the hottest points, the most proximal ones, then a lot of your distal points and lesser points will dissipate on their own and you don't have to treat them. So it also reduces your workload to sequence properly. The next rule is that tender points in the extremities can be found on the opposite side of the pain complaint. This isn't always true, but quite commonly it is. So uh, let's say you have uh, a lot of adductor um, pectineus gracilis dysfunction in here. So if you touch these points in here, skyrockets the patient, okay? Because these points tend to posture the hip into flexion, adduction with internal rotation, it tends to stress the lateral part of the hip, the lateral thigh, and even the knee, so patients can actually start to complain of pain in those areas. Not so much pain in here. Now, sometimes they do complain of pain here also, but sometimes you will find that the in the extremities that the pain can be on the opposite side of the tender point, so just keep that in mind. Okay? Also with counter strain, uh, the technique is very, very gentle. So about 15% of the patients that will get a counter strain treatment can have a post-treatment reaction, which is a post-treatment soreness. Now this soreness sometimes can be quite severe on some people uh, and uh, it's quite surprising to the patient. It's surprising to the patient because the technique is so gentle they don't expect to get sore. So when they do get sore, they're wondering, hey, what did that person do to me, you know? Um, now, if they had deep tissue work, or some aggressive mobilization, or some hard stretching, and they got sore, I don't think that surprises patients. They'd be surprised if they didn't get sore. But when they get sore with counter strain, it's surprising. But again, it's a very small percentage that do get sore, and it's really difficult to predict who is going to get sore. So when you have a patient, you're doing the initial treatment, you want to tell them that there is a possibility that you can be sore following this treatment. If you do get sore, it will last about a day and a half, then it dissipates on its own. It's a normal response to treatment, so if you get it, don't worry. It just will subside in about a day and a half. If you would like to dissipate it even sooner, if you can drink eight to 10 good-sized glasses of water for that day and the next two days, it minimizes any post-treatment soreness. Now, when I have them drink water, I'm not having them drink water to hydrate them. What I want to do is I want them to urinate a lot, okay? So if they drink water and have to urinate, it just flushes out all the metabolic waste that's produced by the treatment and doesn't give it a chance to settle into the muscle tissue where it makes them very sore. So drink a lot, pee a lot is what I tell them. Uh, and lastly, there really are no contraindications to counter strain uh, given the techniques that we're going to do in this class. Uh, in the more advanced classes, we do have some contraindications, but not in this one. Because counter strain is so gentle, and if you're only moving a patient toward a direction and to a position that feels good, that feels comfortable, we don't believe we can hurt anybody with this technique. I have treated cancer patients with multiple uh, tumor sites, multiple fracture sites. I have treated fractures again and done it quite safely with counter strain uh, without uh, causing any irritation. Again, because the technique is so gentle and you're only moving them toward a direction and position that feels good to the patient. To finish up the introductory lecture, I want to talk about uh, some of the more important effects of the counterstrain treatment. Most certainly, it's going to normalize nociceptive thresholds. So it's going to decrease pain. That's probably its primary uh, function is to decrease pain. 
Um, it will also normalize nocifensive reflexes. Nocifensive reflex is just a fancy term for muscle guarding spasms. So by doing this treatment, we're going to relax those muscle guarding spasms, which is going to increase circulation, both arterial flow and venous lymphatic flow out of the area. Uh, it's also going to normalize nociautonomic reflexes, which is going to treat the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and so it's quite nice to be able to treat uh, or have an effect on the smooth muscle spasms that occur with trauma. You, of course, are going to increase joint mobility and range of motion. Here's another thing that I want you to do when you start doing counter strain, because as physical therapists, I know most of you know how to motion test. And you commonly do that because maybe your primary technique of choice is mobilization. Uh, and I want you to know that counter strain does way more than just treat out these tender points and treats out pain. Okay? Counterstrain will treat the dysfunction that produces this point of pain or the pain that the patient is perceiving. Uh, and when you treat that out with counterstrain, not only is the tender point gone, not only is the pain diminished or gone, but joint mobility is increased, joint range of motion is increased, and joint function is improved or normalized. So I want to make this point because some people think that counterstrain strictly just treats pain. But again, it treats the dysfunction that causes the pain. And since most of you do motion testing, I'm going to um, insist that all of you, when you make a counterstrain diagnosis by finding a tender point, motion test that segment, especially in the spine, go ahead and motion test it treat it with counter strain, and then re-motion test it. You will find that joint mobility at that level will be greatly improved or normalized. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, it's going to improve patient's proprioception. It's most certainly going to increase strength. So I'm going to show you in the live class how to take inhibited muscles and regain normal strength without exercise, just by treating the dysfunction that causes the inhibition to that muscle functioning as it should. We're going to improve uh, venous and lymphatic drainage, which is going to take inflammatants out of the area. It's going to improve blood flow. Uh, it's going to improve the immune response and healing capacity, because what we're doing is we're going to create an uh, environment in which healing can take place. Many patients have so much dysfunction that their body, though it should be able to heal, can't. It just cannot go fully through the process of healing because it's just constantly being irritated by all of these dysfunctions. By clearing the dysfunctions, we're going to create an environment around which now the body can fully go through the process of healing. Okay. So by that means, it's going to promote just general wellness with the patient. Uh, and again, it does facilitate the body's ability to heal itself. Okay? We like to think that the body is very intelligent and it knows how to heal itself. And I've used that aspect of the body to my benefit in that I work with a self-correcting mechanism so it does heal. I don't always have to get it perfect because the body will heal. But the environment has to be created for that body to go through the fully go through the process of healing. And this is where you can come in. You can create that environment by getting rid of all the dysfunction. Once that dysfunction is uh, dissipated, now the body can fully go through that process of healing. So you have a very important role with these patients to get them to heal.